Wednesday night service, let's pray and sing to the Lord. Father, we uh, thank you for allowing us to be here. Lord, I thank you for just uh, allowing us to uh, be able to gather around God's word again and hear the word of God preached. Lord, again, I, we need you tonight, and I just ask that you help us, help our hearts to be ready to be a blessing to you, to, be a, to honor and glorify your name. Make our desires, Father, to be the desires you have for us in this life that we might please you. In Jesus' name, amen. 618, stand up, stand up for Jesus.
good evening again, and uh, I want to thank Brother John for being faithful to come in and record our song services, and I appreciate Brother Zach, who's doing all the video and editing work, and I uh, appreciate uh, so many others that are just making sure the normal function of the church is going on during this time, and, and thank you for what you're doing. I've heard great stories about witnessing opportunities and um, inviting people to watch services and attend services. Uh, once we're back to assemble them together again, and so that's a blessing. I hope you'll continue on. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 6 tonight, if you would please. Jeremiah chapter 6. We're going to begin to read in just a moment in verse 13. Again, we're taking a break from the Appetites of the Flesh series on Wednesday night. God willing, we'll get back to that. During this time, I've been using Wednesday nights as the Lord has led to uh, just talk about uh, and challenge our own thinking. Uh, during these unprecedented times right here and make sure that we're thinking uh, correctly. And so we're going to do that again tonight. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 13. Follow along as I read. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace. Peace when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and seek, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. Therefore hear, ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. Tonight I'm going to take the few minutes that we have in this online service, and I want to preach on this subject. The old ways are not the old paths. The old ways are not the old paths, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that as we get into the message right after we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you teach us how we ought to think and how we ought to behave. And Lord, I pray that we'd give attention to your word tonight. I pray that you would challenge our thinking, Lord, and help us, God. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just give us full sight of the truth that we need to see as it is in reality. And Lord, help us to conform ourselves to your word and to the image of your son. I pray that uh, you would help us in this, Lord. Thank you for being near to us and uh, dear to us and caring for us. And God, I pray that uh, I pray that you would get glory out of everything that's said and done tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Just to give you a little bit of background of what's going on leading to this passage, when Jeremiah starts off his ministry during the reign of Josiah, king of Judah, he uh, begins to preach that the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, that they need to repent because if they don't, then God's going to judge, God's going to chasten, and uh, they're not going to like it. And he would preach, repent, repent, repent. And yet the people wouldn't repent. The people wouldn't listen. Uh, history teaches us that the more Jeremiah preached, the more his word was dismissed, the more he was looked at as some sort of fanatic, and and the more comfortable the people felt. As a matter of fact, uh, even in, during the reign of Jehoiakim, which was Josiah's son, Jeremiah was preaching, but at that particular time, it seemed outlandish, it seemed ridiculous that any of the things that Jeremiah prophesied were going to happen uh, that any of those things were going to come about because things seemed prosperous, uh, things seemed like they were just well under control, and uh, they, they seemed like everything was just going really, really well, and, and things were successful. 
and that uh, none of the judgment that Jeremiah was saying was going to come uh, would ever happen. Well, by Jeremiah chapter 6, Jeremiah's message changes a little bit in that in the first five books of Jeremiah, Jeremiah's been saying, repent. There's still time to be saved. There's still time to turn the mind of God away from what He thinks to do. But this is God's plan as as it is right now. And if you don't turn, then God's not going to turn. And God's waiting for you to repent. And God wants you to repent. And God wants you to change your ways. And He's been preaching that message through the first five chapters of the book of Jeremiah. But all of a sudden, in Jeremiah chapter 6, the message changes a little bit. And in Jeremiah chapter 6, essentially what Jeremiah begins to preach is, all right, the, the time for uh, the, the, the plan of God being changed is done. It has already been set in motion. Events ha- are, have already began to transpire. And nothing is going to turn the tide of what is about to happen. Now, you can flee if you want to. You can run. As a matter of fact, you can repent and you should repent. But repenting is not going to change the outcome at this point. Repentance is not going to save you from the calamity and the trauma that is coming uh, uh, your direction. And Jeremiah says that the king of the north, the king of Babylon... He's going to come and He's going to overtake Judah and He's already on His way. Back in uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, listen to the way He says it in verse number 1, O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem and blow the trumpet in Tekoa and set up a sign of fire in Beth Hasarim. For evil appeareth out of the north and great destruction. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman The shepherds with their flocks shall come unto her. They shall pitch their tents against her round about. They shall feed every one in his place. Prepare ye war against her. Arise, let us go up at noon. Woe unto us, for the day goeth away. For the shadows of the evening are stretched out. Arise, and let us go by night, and let us destroy her palaces. For thus hath the Lord of hosts said, Hew hew ye down trees, and cast a mount against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. She is holy oppression in the midst of her. So here's what Jeremiah begins to preach here, that there's trouble coming out of the north, and Nebuchadnezzar and his armies of Babylon are already on the way, and they're going to get here, and by the hand of God and by the design of God, they are going to set their tents and they're going to pitch them against Jerusalem, and against Judah, and they're going to besiege the city, and they're going to wait it out. Now, at this point, uh, uh, Jerusalem was a, a big city. It was a fortified city. It was a walled city. Within the walls of, of the city of Jerusalem, they felt safe. They felt content there. They felt like that, that nothing bad could happen to them. But he said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be besieged, and they're going to come, and they're going to pitch their tents, and they're going to surround you, and they're not going to let any escape. And they're going to wait it out. And things are going to get really bad. And if you want to flee, now's the time to flee. But not even repenting can change the circumstance of the way it's going to be. Now, they had already been hearing the preaching about repenting and God turning from the thoughts that He would do toward them. But that time was done now. And events were already in motion that were not going to be stopped even if the people were to repent. Now, God's going to bring judgment. And now that judgment is certain. And God never brings judgment against the people without telling them why they are being judged. Why uh, things are bad in their midst and about to get worse. So in verses 7 through 12, He talks about how bad the judgment is going to be and how extensive the judgment is going to be. And and, uh, we find in other prophets and the way that they preached and prophesied that that the people wouldn't believe if they were told what was going to happen and how bad it was going to be. They couldn't possibly foresee the calamity that was coming. And if if they heard somebody tell them the truth about what was going to happen, they would not receive it. They would not believe it. 
And it was going to be extensive. We get into verse number 13, and God through Jeremiah begins to tell them, and by the way, this is why this calamity is coming. This is why this judgment is coming. And here's why, verse 13. Because for from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness. He immediately begins to deal with a hard issue of the people. That they are a covetous people. Well, preacher, what does that mean to be covetous? What, is it, what does that mean that the people are wholly given to, to uh, covetousness? Well, it, it means this. That the, uh, the, one of the best ways to define covetousness is by, the, uh, by uh, pointing out the opposite of covetousness, which is contentment. So it could be defined like this. Covetousness is a complete lack of contentment. To be covetous is to be desirous of things that you do not have. It is to be desirous of material things. It is to be desirous of more and more and more. And it's not just material. It can be somebody else's position. It can be somebody else's station in life that you desire, that you want, that you crave for yourself. And he said that the whole population is given unto covetousness. Now when he says from the least to the greatest, here's here's what he's talking about. He's not talking about from the youngest to the oldest or the smallest to the largest. When he says from the least to the greatest, he's talking about socioeconomic status here. He's talking about a position within society. He's saying that the poor people are covetous and the rich people are covetous and everybody in between, and everybody along the spectrum, everybody is not content with what they have in life. And this is a characteristic that God points out that defines the people of Judah and Jerusalem, that they are wholly given to covetousness. So it it would look like this, that the rich people, well, I... Preacher, you know how bad those rich people are. I tell you, rich people are the worst. They're so greedy. They have all their, they have all that money and they have all that wealth. Uh, a lot of people don't uh, seem to realize that some people have money because they're good with money. Some people would be considered rich because, well, they they're frugal. Uh, I'm not going to use the word tight, but. They don't like spending money. They don't like turning loose of money. And so they have money. Some people that don't have money don't have money not because money's not available, but because they're bad with money. Because they blow it on every little thing. They just, they just drive right through money and they don't know how to save and they don't, they don't understand thrift. But anyway, it would look like this, this holy given to covetousness. It'd be like the people that are rich and have resources Well, they want more. They're not content with what they have, and so they want more. And then it would look like this. You go down to the poor people, and the poor people, well, they don't have resources, but what defines their life? Well, what defines their life is a desire for more. And it doesn't matter where you fit along that spectrum. Everybody wants more. Nobody is content with what they have in life. So if you walked into Jerusalem during this particular time period when Jeremiah is preaching this message, it would be like this. Everybody's concerned about acquiring more materialism, uh, more material possessions. Everybody's concerned about acquiring more riches. Everybody's concerned about me, 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 and my development and my rights. And everybody's just, everybody's very selfish And everybody's concerned about the next handout. And everybody's concerned about what is there for me to acquire and attain. Wholly given to covetousness. Nobody's content. Nobody at this particular time is saying, Lord, I just appreciate that you've blessed me. And Lord, it's enough. God, your blessing in my life is enough. God... Even if you, even if you see fit for me to have less, God, I know you're going to meet my needs because you promised. And God, because you promised to meet my needs, I know that I'll, I'll never go hungry. And, and I know that I'll never, 
uh, I'll never be begging for bread. And, and, and Lord, because I know that as my Father, You protect me and You provide for me. And, and God, I might not have any more than my need, but Lord, I will have my need met and I trust that. And God, I'm, I'm content with that. <laughs> Nobody is praying like that. As a matter of fact, we could probably go ahead and mark it down. Nobody's really praying during this time. Everybody's very consumed with materialism, prosperity, and success. Now when you go back and you study Jewish history, that's simply not the reality of the situation at all. At least under Jehoiakim, they were under tribute to Egypt. Uh, Jehoiakim was kind of like a puppet vassal to the Pharaoh of Egypt, voluntarily giving him tribute and everything like that. And the security that he felt like he was getting from that relationship turned out to be absolutely nothing and not to be trusted at all. And they, they wasted a lot of resources uh, trying to get in the right camp and have the right ally and have the right associations that would be their protection and their power, and it turned out to be nothing when Nebuchadnezzar showed up from the north and besieged the city. And where was Egypt then? Well, not there. So while they've got themselves tricked into thinking that everything's very prosperous and everything's very successful, they're literally paying through the nose for the protection of a nation who can't protect them at all. Giving up all kinds of silver and gold and other resources. And at the same time, they're wholly given to covetousness. It's incredibly vain. Then he says this, from the prophet even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Let me sum that up by saying this. Jeremiah said, here's what's going on. And this is why God's bringing judgment. Because you can't find anybody that will actually tell the truth about what's going on. You can't find you can't you can't look around and you can't find anybody that will just be honest with the current situation in Jerusalem and in Judah right now. There is there is nobody that's telling the truth. Uh, they might be saying different things, but they're saying different things from the perspective of personal advantage, and everyone is dealing falsely with the people. There is, there is no information that is going through society that legitimately and accurately describes the truth of the situation. There is no reality in anybody's perspective, and everybody's got their own perspective, and everybody's got their own opinion, but everybody's dealing falsely, and there's not, there's not anybody telling the truth. Well, somebody says, well, Jeremiah is a prophet. And he's preaching, thus saith the Lord. Well, by this time, Jeremiah wasn't so much looked at as a prophet as much as he was a watchman. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. But God did appoint watchmen to stand up and say, hey, everybody needs to take notice of what's going on and the reality of this situation and the reality of what's happening around you right now, but they wouldn't hearken to the watchman. And that's exactly what's going on with Jeremiah. But you got other people over here that call themselves uh, prophets, and you got people over here that call themselves priests. And so it could be said like this to a certain degree. You've got political figures over here, and you've got religious figures over here, and none of them are telling the truth. Everybody's got a personal angle. And everybody is dealing falsely with the people. <coughs> Pardon. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. Now think about this. It's like Jerusalem and Judah has a big gaping wound and they've healed it slightly. What does that mean? Well, it, it, it would be understood the way we would say it like this. It'd be like taking one little small band-aid and putting it over a wide open gaping wound and saying, now look, that ought to cover that. That'll keep that from infection. That'll take care of that. But yeah, that, that'll heal right up. Uh, healing something slightly is nowhere close to healing it completely. 
They're just dealing with the surface. And on the surface, what they're saying is, peace, peace. The problem is, there is no peace. There is no peace. Well, why is there no peace? Well, because Babylon's already on its way. Nebuchadnezzar is already making his way from the north. Economic times are already turbulent. Assyria, the, the northern kingdom, has already been either taken captive or completely infiltrated. Uh, 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 Samaria and, and, and the northern kingdom have been completely infiltrated by the Assyrians. And they've already taken, taken people captive and they've already scattered the northern kingdom out, and, and, and Judah had a front row seat to watch what God had allowed to happen by way of judgment to the northern kingdom, and they had also themselves been impacted by what happened to the northern kingdom, and yet they're sitting down there, and life goes on, and while things are crumbling all around them, they're telling themselves, you know what, we're, uh, yeah, we've got some minor setbacks right now, but we're going to get back to the old ways. And we've got some things that aren't going really in our advantage right now. But they'll soon be over. And we'll be getting back to the old ways. And so you got these leaders that are coming around saying, Hey, uh, peace. Uh, these are times of peace. Hey, everything's okay. Hey, everything's rosy. Hey, safety. Everything's good. You're protected. You're taken care of. You're provided for. Look at what we're doing for you. Uh, look, look at uh, uh, look at the situation through our eyes, and they're saying peace and peace. The problem is, in reality, there is no peace, and that's the situation. Everyone's given to covetousness. Their leaders were lying to them. Nobody was telling the truth. Everybody was dealing falsely. And then finally he deals with this. He says, hey, what we really need to do to determine if there's real peace or not is let's determine the spiritual condition of the people. Because the only way there can actually be peace, the only way there can actually be prosperity and success, the only way that these things can come that everybody around you is boasting for is if this people is right with God. The only way we can have true prosperity and success is if we have the blessing of God. The only way we can really have peace and safety is by the blessing of God. So it's easy to determine if we've got the blessing of God, and that is, are the people in a position to be blessed by God? Are the, position, are, are the people in a position to receive blessings from God what is their spiritual condition? Uh-oh. Well, everybody sins. We know that. As a matter of fact, if you were to go back to Numbers chapter 20, 21, right in there, I believe it's Numbers chapter 21, what you would find is that Israel was a sinful nation murmuring, backbiting against God. And yet God still blessed His people. Aren't you glad that God can bless sinful people? Aren't you glad that even a sinner can know the blessings of God upon his life? But I will tell you this, if you do go back to Numbers chapter 21 and you do read that account, God is not able to bless His people until His people turn back to God. And that happened in a cycle over and over again. That God can't bless until His people turn to Him and get right with Him. And in order to turn to God and get right with Him, there has to be the repentance of sin. And in order for there to be the repentance of sin, we must see our sin as exceedingly sinful. I didn't make that up. That's right in the Word of God. That for true repentance of sin to take place. We've got to see our sin for what it is and we've got to agree with uh, we got to agree with the way that God 
views our sin, and in our own estimation, in our own heart, our own sin must be to us exceeding sinful, and we must agree with God that it is sinful, and that it is a reproach, and that it is abomination, and we must turn from it, and then God can freely bless His people. Then God's people can know what true prosperity and success is. God's people can know what true peace and safety really is. But these are things that can only come from the hand of God, and the, uh, the hand of God can only distribute those to those who agree with Him about their sin and have, and have turned from their sin to Him. And so Jeremiah just deals with this in verse 15 when he says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Now look, you have committed abominations. I've committed abominations. All of us have sinned. It's not whether or not we are sinners that, that makes the difference in whether or not we can be blessed by God. It is how do we respond to the sin that we know that we've committed. And the question that he asks here, were the people ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay. I know that's a King James word that needs some translation. It means no. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay. That means no. They were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. As a matter of fact, not only were they not ashamed, Jeremiah says, not only are the people not ashamed of the sin that they commit uh, very openly and very publicly, not only are they not ashamed about that, but they are very proud of it. They're very boastful of it. They don't even blush. There's no longer even the sense of wrongdoing. Uh, 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 Paul would say it like this about the last days, that their conscience is seared with a hot iron. They are past feeling. There's not even something inside anymore that says, you know that's wrong. They've resisted that knowledge of morality built in by God so often. The conscience is past feeling. They don't even blush when they've committed abomination. If you walked through Jerusalem and Judah, there would be sinful activity and sinful behavior right out in the open and not one person ashamed of it. It, it would be funny to some. It would be the passion of others. There's just no shame. And yet, as Jeremiah stands and delivers this message and preaches this content, the people don't believe that he's telling the truth. The people don't believe that the judgment of God is at hand. You say, boy, it's going to be a rude awakening, preacher, when that judgment shows up. Well, if we keep reading the prophets, here's the scariest thing about it. As the judgment of God arrives and as things progressively get worse and worse and worse and worse for the people of Jerusalem and Judah, do you think they learn something from it? Do you think they eventually tune in and say, you know what, this Jeremiah was right? Do you think the people go, you know what, I think there might have been something to that message? Do you know what actually happens? Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. They're, they they end up besieged all the way around the city and locked into their own city to the point of starvation. And the people are saying this. This will be over in a little bit. And we'll get back to the way it was. This will be over in a little bit. We'll, get, we'll just get back to the old ways. This will all be done. This will all pass. It's just a little setback. We'll get through it. And then they actually breach the city and start carrying away cap people captive. Well, now God's got their attention. No, read the book of Ezekiel. 
They actually get taken into captivity. And you know what the people in captivity are saying? Now, I don't understand really everything that's going on, but this is, this is just temporary. We'll, we'll be back to the old ways here shortly. We'll be back to the way that things are. And nobody ever really gave much thought to this idea. Maybe God has no desire for things to get back to the way that they are. Maybe God's bringing this judgment. Maybe God's bringing these, these actions along in the nation of uh, Judah and in the city of Jerusalem as an effort to change things to the way they ought to be. Well, I know, preacher, but lives are being lost here. People are going through very difficult times. And they're only going to get worse. I mean, this is pretty bad. Uh, God Himself said it was going to be really bad. And, and things are really bad for people. People's economic world is turned upside down. And, and then people come to the point of starvation. And, and people are actually dying. And people are kidnapped. And people are taken uh, to be servants of other nations. And, and people are completely re relocated in, in places where they're going to have to start a new life. And it's going to be like this for, for, for 70 years. I mean, this is really bad stuff. Why can't God just let things go back to the old ways the way they were, would be? Well, let me ask you this. Doesn't righteousness mean something? Seems to me God cares about righteousness. No, that, that's what the passage is dealing with here. Well, doesn't God care about people? Well, of course God cares about people. Well, doesn't God care about the condition of people? Of course God cares about the condition of people. But God also cares about righteousness. God also cares about truth. And when people do not live according to truth and righteousness, there are consequences for that. And the consequences for that are set forth by a holy God who cares very much about truth and who cares very much about righteousness. And as much as He cares about humanity, He also cares about truth and righteousness. And when truth and righteousness are forsaken by humanity, then humanity has to pay the price. Well, preacher, that's not a very popular message. Well, they didn't think so either when Jeremiah preached. And most of them didn't believe that things were bad enough that God would actually bring judgment against them. So in verse 16, Jeremiah says this, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see. I love this line right here. Because here's what, here's what Jeremiah is saying. Jeremiah says, you don't believe me that the judgment of God is coming and you really need to believe me. You really do need to believe me that God is about to judge His people for their unrighteousness and for their falsehood and their complete lack of honesty and reality. God's bringing judgment against you and I know you don't believe me. So here's what I want you to do. Go out here and look with your own eyes and see if I'm right about the condition of the people. Because if I'm right about the condition of the people, then I'm right that a righteous God must judge unrighteousness. So he says, this is what God is inviting you to do. You go out here and stand in the ways and see. Go out here where people are going about their everyday daily lives. Go down here to the marketplace and see how people are spending and investing their resources. Go, go down here and just watch the materialism as it is in the economy, in the marketing situation. Then I want you to go over here to the, to the city hall. And I want you to just look at city hall. And I want you to hear what messages are coming out of City Hall. And go over here to the temple and hear what messages are coming out of the temple. And I just want you to go out here and I want you to stand in the ways and see. I want you to see if people are given to covetousness. I want you to see 
if the leaders of the country are dealing falsely with the people. I want you to stand out here and see the spiritual condition of the people when they commit abomination. Are they ashamed of it? Because if I'm telling you the truth about the condition of the people, then know this, I'm telling you the truth about the certainty of the judgment of God against unrighteousness. So go out here and stand in the ways and see. And when you see that I'm right, ask for the old paths. What does that mean? Ask for the old paths. Well, I titled the message, The Old Paths Are Not the Same as the Old Ways. Because see, all the people were doing while Jeremiah was preaching these messages is that they were sitting around waiting for things to get back to the way they had been. Waiting to get back to the ways where things were the most comfortable. Waiting to get back where things were the most convenient. People were going through difficulty and they were about to wade through even more difficulty with the mindset, we've just got to get through this slight inconvenience and we've got to get through this time of difficulty. And they had their minds fixed on, we just wanted life to go back to the way it was. But I'm going to tell you right now, God wasn't bringing this activity to the nation of Judah and to the city of Jerusalem for things to ever get back to the way they were. God was bringing chastisement so that the people would understand they were not good the way they were. They need to be different. They need to be different. So if you're going to look for old paths, it's not the same as just sitting around wanting things to go back to the way that they were. That's not the old paths. To find the old paths, you're going to have to go back further than that. To find the old paths, you're going to have to go back not to a time where people did things a certain way, but back to a time when people thought differently. When righteousness mattered to a nation. No, righteousness exalteth a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. This is what the Word of God tells us. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. If you want to ask about the old paths, then what you got to do is you got to look back and go, when did we have the blessing of God upon us? When, when did God keep us uh, in peace and safety? When, when did God have us in true uh, prosperity and, and success and well-being? When was it evident that God's hand was upon us? And I'm telling you, you're not going to look back and find a sinless time in any nation or a sinless time in any people. But what you will do is you will look back and, and realize, look, there was a time when God had His hand upon this nation. This is what they were supposed to do in Jerusalem. Judah could look back and say, look, here's a time when God had His hand upon us. And one of the leading characteristics of our people at that time was that people cared about righteousness. People cared about the holiness of God. People cared about being separate from sinners. Not above them, but se separate from them. Having received the grace of God and the mercy of God and the goodness of God, it was more important to them to live a life that was pleasing to God than a life that fit into the society that was around them. And, and righteousness mattered to them. And there were some old paths that people used to walk when righteousness really mattered. And when God was truly blessing. Ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Now, Jeremiah, this all sounds well and good and everything, but righteousness doesn't matter. Also, I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. So God says, therefore, judgment. Judgment. 
Let me uh, make some application and we'll be done today. I am not qualified, nor do I have the authority to say that what is going on in the United States of America right now is the judgment of God. I don't receive special revelation from God. I am not a prophet. There's nothing in me that can stand in this pulpit or any other pulpit and say, this virus that has stricken the United States of America, this, this collapse of the economy, the joblessness that is existing in our country right now among believers and non-believers alike, but the, the woes that we are facing right now are the judgment of God. I'm not qualified to say that, and furthermore, neither is any other preacher out there. We don't hear from God in that way. Like Jeremiah was able to stand with certainty and say, we don't do that. So let me stick with what I can say with certainty. What I can say with certainty is this. That sin is sin and unrighteousness is unrighteousness. Tonight, let me say with certainty this. That as I stand in the ways and see in the United States of America today, what I see is a people from the least of them to the greatest of them. Only given to judgment. It, it's absolutely amazing to me things that are going on in our government and with the, the economic stimulus package and things like that and how many people are clamoring for more money, more money with zero productivity to society and yet people are demanding more materialism uh, more more material possessions, more resources, uh, this this uh, living wage, and this this right to make wages from the government for producing nothing that doesn't exist anywhere in reality and doesn't work anywhere at any point in history or the present and never will in the future. It, it's amazing to me how many people are wholly given to covetous. And I'm talking about from the homeless to the people that have a home, a second home, a lake home, a tiny home, a mansion, and everything in between. I mean, we've got <laughs> we've got we've got people that are homeless that are just fighting for more stuff. Everything they can get. All the way up to people that have more money than any one person could ever spend in a lifetime. Bragging about what kind of ice cream they have in a $24,000 home freezer. Covetousness. Holy given. That's what I see when I stand in the way. When I stand in the ways and see, I find it very difficult to get accurate information from anybody. Because I don't think it's just me that can say that it seems like everyone deals falsely with them. Say in peace and safety and protection and provision, but from where? My peace and my safety and my security is supposed to come from a handout from a government that is trillions upon trillions of dollars in debt? And I'm supposed to feel secure about that and safe about that? And that thought is supposed to fill my heart with peace? Are you kidding me? And everyone's dealing false. When I stand in the ways, I see this. I see people all throughout our nation today living in abomination. 
abundance of sinful behavior and there's no shame. There's no shame in the lies that are told by the media on a daily basis. There's no, there's no shame in the way that the truth and reality are skewed to fit somebody's personal preference or somebody's personal opinion. There's no shame in homosexuality. There's no shame in abortion. They were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. I could go on and on with the amount of open, rampant, sinful behavior that's going on. And there's no shame. In truth, when I stand in the ways and see what's going on in our country today, I see much the same situation that Jeremiah preached about in his day in Jerusalem and Judah. And in the same message that Jeremiah identified this condition of the nation, he also told them that God's judgment was coming and there was nothing they could do to stop it. Hear me very carefully. My Bible also tells me, and I'm standing on good ground here, my Bible also tells me that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That He is immutable that he is unchanging. What I want you to understand tonight is that if God enumerated these qualifiers as ready for his certain judgment in Jeremiah 6, and God doesn't respond the same to the United States of America, who's in the same spiritual condition, then it might just be similar to what Billy Graham said back a few decades ago. Then God might owe an apology. What, what Billy Graham actually said was that with all of the sodomy that's going on in the United States of America, if God didn't judge it, He would owe Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. It's a bold statement. But I'm just saying, God's unchanging. God's immutable. Do you know why? Because God cares about righteousness. And if God cares about righteousness, then God must judge unrighteousness. And while I'm not standing here in this pulpit tonight saying that this virus is part of the judgment of God, I am saying this. It wouldn't surprise me a bit if this was something that God was allowing in the United States of America and upon the whole world for that matter, for unrighteousness, and it wouldn't surprise me a bit if this is just the start of the top. Right now we're sitting around thinking, we're just going to get past this, and then we're going to get back to the way that things were. And God might just love us too much and love righteousness too much to allow things to get back to the way that they were. It might just be that God's wanting to make some changes. South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church. Yeah, there's some things that we want to get back to. There's some things that we will get back to in obedience to what God's told us. But let's not think, well, let's just get everything back to the way it was. Because that might not be what God's trying to accomplish. And once again, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not prophesying when I say this. I'm just being honest with us and saying, this virus thing that's, that's overturned our economy, that's turned a lot of individual and personal lives upside down, it might be the hem of the garment before this thing's all said and done. What started as an inconvenience to the people of Jerusalem didn't conclude for over 70 years where most of them had died off. And then when things get 
did get back to Jerusalem, and when they did get the temple rebuilt, and when they, when they got the city rebuilt, and when they got the walls rebuilt, they understood that even in the rebuilding of these things, they're not like they used to be. But here's the reality. If the old ways are not righteous, then the old ways are not worth returning to. What we need to look for are the old paths of righteousness where we can know God's blessing in our life once again. Let's pray that God will bring this to a conclusion. Nothing wrong with that. But more than that, let's pray that God would have His way however He chooses to work to bring people to a realization and a love for righteousness and holiness once again. And let's let God start that change in us. And then no matter what judgment comes our way, we can have rest for our soul. No, it might be that the righteous have to go through the judgment with the unrighteous but we can have rest for our soul. Even while we go through the judgment of God, knowing that righteousness matters, that holiness matters, that personal separation from sinfulness and from unrepentant sinners is a real thing that we need to get back to if we really care about God. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank You for Your Word. I pray that You'd use it to stir our hearts, challenge our hearts. And Lord, give us the right perspective in what's going on around us. And Lord, help us not to be like the rest of the country around us or the rest of the world, just hoping for the day that things get back to the way they were when they were comfortable and when they were when they were so convenient, when they were so easy. But God, may it be a desire of the heart of every child of God that we get back to righteousness, even if we never get the comfort back, even if we never get the convenience back. Lord, help us to have a desire more than anything to get back to a people that has a love for you and a desire to be right with you more than anything else. Lord, stir a heart of revival in our midst to ask. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you for tuning in to the service tonight. If you have any questions, uh, please contact us either through the church's website uh, or phone number, and we'd be happy to try to answer uh, any questions that you have. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be uh, having some things opening back up here in the next couple of weeks and, and be able to have some maybe small at first, but some assemblies again. We'll be uh, updating you about that as we have information, giving you details. If you need anything in the meantime, please let us know, and God bless.